callers on other subjects, but this is the real world. I mean, Tosh Plumley is a famous two-time whistleblower that's really out of the Pentagon. You, you heard him give out secret information on air. Praetorian Guard, Pentagon groups, those are guys that have been in there forever. And just basically say, we're not going to give missiles to Al-Qaeda. That's how out of control this criminal group is, that they think you're so stupid that they'll give weapons to Al-Qaeda to blow up churches. And it does show that the moral evil has gotten so out of control that people are now risking their lives to tell you the truth. The AP is now reporting that, uh, you know, back in 19... 85, U.S. provides 500,000 so Afghan rebels can tell their story. And then see on 9-11, a group of them were protected to be involved in what they were involved in. And then Saudi Arabia, when Al-Qaeda took the blame for what they were involved in, but solely took the blame, then they get rewarded with the whole Middle East later. This deal was made a long time ago. It transcends Obama. It transcends these groups. Believe me, I study this stuff 24-7. We told you within days what Benghazi was, a hit. When you've got almost an eight-hour stand down while they try to kill four people in a building, and they tell you the White House didn't know about it, they gave the order to kill those people. And that's what I've said day one. We know they're lying about it. We know it was a gun running operation. We know they had three warehouses full of weapons. We know the ambassador from Turkey was there. We now know that Al-Qaeda launched chemical attacks on Syria to blame them. It's all come out. It's in mainstream Turkish news and the BBC even that Turkey ran false flags to blame Syria again this year. And it's the defense minister with the top general. And, and the defense minister is going, you know, I'd really like maybe a terror attack like this or maybe an attack on our bases like that. And the general goes, man, look, we do that all the time. Stop talking about it over the phone. You can read the transcript. We know what to do. And obviously the Russians are there. They've got their own systems stealing all those communications. And the general, we read the stuff two weeks ago on air, is like, uh, minister, stop talking about it. Just say you want it. We know what to do. We do this all the time. There's the headline. Why Turkey was planning a false flag operation in Syria. That's Infowars.com wrote about it. That's Zero Hedge. But it was also in the BBC. And now it comes out, and the public doesn't even know what that is. But it's so funny reading the transcript, and the audio was released. I just don't speak Turkish. And he's going, maybe you bomb our base. Maybe you blow up hotel. Maybe you uh, attack this. Maybe you attack that. Maybe you hit our troops. And the general's like, we know what to do. Yes, just tell us to do it. We'll do something. We, 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 we've got plans. I told you, one of the first things WikiLeaks released in a group of documents back in, uh, I don't know, it was like three or four years ago, and I covered it on air at nauseam. This was about five years ago when it was first happening. I don't remember how many years ago it was. Look it up. Here's the headline, WikiLeaks. Army manual talks about false flag. That'll bring it up. And it's for captains in special operations in the Army who are in special infiltration force multiplication operations, classic Green Beret type operations. And it talks about in emergencies, if you need to motivate a village that's not going with, along with you for their own good, of course, you blow some people up and blame it on an enemy. This has been going on forever. U.S. counterinsurgency manual, manual leaked, calls for false flag operations, suspension of human rights. And there is the document. At WikiLeaks, U.S. Special Forces, go back to the top, I'm going to read it, thanks. Foreign Internal Defense Tactics Techniques and Procedures for Special Forces, FM 31-20-3, 2003. And, but that's, that's when the manual was issued. It came out, I think, 2008, I'm going from memory, 2009. Yeah, it came out in 2008. Why don't I just read the, read the, read the page? I'm just so run off my memory, not even the document. There it is. And uh, there they are telling folks about how they're going to be sent for special classes.
they go on to say, we've learned about running death squads and propping up corrupt governments in Latin America, but how do we keep that in place? The document, which is official U.S. Special Forces policy, directly advocates training paramilitaries, pervasive surveillance, look at America, censorship, press control, restrictions on labor unions and political parties, suspending habeas corpus, Patriot Act, warrantless searches, Detainment without charge, NDAA, bribery, employing terrorists, false flag operations, concealing human rights abuses from journalists, and extensive use of psychological operations, propaganda, to make these and other population and resource control measures palatable. That's what it's called, population and resource control. We are the human resource. <laughs> but not all of the special forces officers get these. Those psychologically tracked, traced, tested, and shown that they want to be winners are taught how to win. And let me tell you how you win. You grab a little boy in the village, and you torture him and put cigarettes out all over him and electrocute him. And then you pull up in a car when you know people are go walking to work or whatever from the village and you act like they catch you throwing the body out in the uniforms of your enemies. That's a simple one. And you can kill one little kid and get the whole town on your side. Now, men, do you do that to save the whole region from corruption and to not have to have a full-scale war that could kill hundreds of thousands? Or do you kill the one little boy per town? The end justifies the means Machiavelli. And you've been chosen because you've shown you're willing to do what it takes to win for good. See, that's the whole apocalypse now, Colonel Kurtz deal, where he talks about they come in and inoculate the special forces, the Vietnamese kids, and uh, so the uh, regular uh, Viet Cong military comes along and chops off all the arms of the inoculation. Of course, the story is it's a good inoculation. So, you know, but, but still, don't take anything from the GIs, or we're going to cut your arm off. And he says they weren't bad men. They weren't evil men. They were trained cadres. They, they, they had women and children. They, they were married. They did it. They were loving men. It, was, it hit me like a diamond bullet that this is what we have to build. This is what we have to do. And the other special forces killer that's been sent to kill him realizes he's completely insane. No, Colonel Kurtz is not insane according to the real strategies that were employed in Vietnam. And I'm telling you, you don't win wars like this, ladies and gentlemen. But you wouldn't be in an immoral war if you were moral. You have to have the moral high ground to win wars. And then, even if you don't have the good weapons, history shows you cannot be defeated long term. That's why the globalists all day talk about how they're moral and they're good and they're great and they care and they've got all the answers and you're bad and you're racist and you're this and that because they need the moral high ground. The attacks we suffer constantly are that I'm not moral and I'm fake and I'm this and that because the government listens to my phones and tracks me. They know I'm completely real and fearless and committed. Do I eat too much sometimes? Sometimes under stress, do I drink too much? Sure, everybody's human. Do I go years sometimes without drinking a beer? Yes, and I don't even smoke cigars anymore. But when it comes to being moral, I'm extremely moral. Compared to most people, I'm very moral. I won't cheat people. I pay my crew. I don't, I mean, most people in the entertainment industry, as they would call this, I'm not in entertainment, but that's what it's genre, you know, news, media. Almost everybody that works for History and Discovery Channel, all these things now work for free. Even establishment camera people that have been working 20, 30 years have to work a lot of time for free or, or, or almost nothing just to stay in the industry because they don't understand that they all sold themselves out so cheap. There's a glut now. And I get calls all the time and they go, you want to be on our TV show? And I go, yeah, $20,000. Well, we don't pay people. Well, good. You're not going to talk to me. Boom. And it's not even about the money. It's about these whores and the mainstream media are going to pay me, pay up. You understand that? And I'm going to use that money back against you.
I don't play your little stinking games. I give the good people of America the best products, the lowest prices we can bring you that I personally vetted and use. We fund ourselves off goodwill and off of being honorable and high quality. But when it comes to the establishment, sometimes they offer me money and I say, I'm just not going to do it. Well, we are the such and such, you know, New York Times. You don't want us to come down to your offices? And I say, no. What, so you can act like you're a journalist and act like you found out who I really am? I've already learned that lesson. I don't do it anymore. I'm not bragging here. I'm just telling everybody Hollywood and the whole culture has nothing to offer. I've been in big movies. I've been at the big parties. I've been out on the boats and the private jets. I've seen it all. I've been at the highest mountains of crap. And let me tell you, all of you that feel inadequate and believe in this system or scare what your neighbor thinks about you or don't feel good because your car isn't the nicest, none of that.